conversation this evening on the subject of Islamic calligraphy from a local perspective. My name is Pogeng Setai. I'm a doctoral researcher at the Center for Humanities Research and a final year PhD candidate in the Department of Anthropology at the University of the Western Cape. I'm also curatorial researcher here at the museum and I will be your host this evening. Before I begin the conversation, I would like to introduce our speakers. Belinda, can I have the slide, please? Firstly, on my far left, I've got the noble Dr. Mohammed Fadil Arnold. <laughs> Dr. Arnold is the director of the ICRA, Islamic Center for Research and Activity for Training of Holistic Methodologists, and a local and international consultant in arts in Islam holistic education, educational resource development, learner-centeredness, integration in OBE, transformation of disruptive learners, holistic problem solving, and whole school development. And then to my left here, I've got the legendary Mr. Ahmad Soni. Mr. Soni is a legendary Islamic calligrapher and designer from Cape Town, South Africa. His journey into the art and cultural space in South Africa began in the year 1982. When he, wa when he was inspired to make his first calligraphic work. It was during this politically tumultuous decade of the 1980s that he developed an inclination towards the practice of Islamic calligraphy and had his first exhibition in 1985. I mean, the rest is history after that. In the middle, we've got Mr. Shaheen, his son. Shaheen is a self-taught artist and educator living and working in Cape Town. He holds a degree in computer science from the University of Cape Town, following the completion of which, in the year 1994, Shaheen went to pursue information technology for about seven years, three of which he spent in the Netherlands. So how the discussion is going to commence tonight is that I will hand over to Mr. Sony, to Mr. I mean Dr. Arnold to give a contextualization on the subject matter, after which Shaheen is going to present for about 20 to 25 minutes. And then we will play a video that Dr. Arnold made about 20 years ago, where he interviewed Islamic artists living in the Boakab region, if I'm correct, Doctor. Is your mic on? Uh, generally in the Cape. In the Cape, yeah, yeah, generally in the Cape. And then we'll begin the discussion. We will bring Mr. Mr. Ahmad Soni. Before I hand over to you, Dr. Arnold, a few housekeeping rules. The sanitizer, for those who'd like to make sure that everything is, is clean and, and, and COVID free, please maintain social distancing. And for those looking for the bathrooms, they're downstairs to the left. And yeah, over to you, Dr. Arnold. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And good evening. As we have to start everything with Bismillah rahman rahim in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. One of the most core features in calligraphy is actually the basmala, as they call it. It has been done in various forms and in various materials, but they always tend to use the Bismillah rahman rahim And it's been, it's just absolutely amazing. What I can, in actual fact, relate to the audience is that because of a hadith, a statement of the Prophet, peace be upon him, um, who advised somebody not to draw people and animals that have a soul, the Muslims then started with symbolism um, in order not to violate the Sharia or the laws or the advice of the creator because the hadith goes on and says if you present somebody in form and you want to imitate the life of a person through an art piece then on the day of judgment you will be asked to put life into it so that has made the artist in islam to focus on symbolism calligraphy and other features of representation other than the actual figure, figurative art. 
So what I must say is that because the Quran is the core feature of Islam, calligraphy is the core base of the art world. But the, the arts in Islam has got basically nine areas of which calligraphy is one ninth of the actual features within the arts in Islam. And we will be focusing on calligraphy itself. But just for interest sake, I'd like to just present to you the other eight forms or aspects of the arts in Islam. It deals with spiritual states. There are certain symbols for spiritual states. There are certain symbols for spiritual stations. There are symbols for architecture, specific architecture and the design. Then there is the music as a specific style and a specific meter and rhythm. Then there is a specific feature of planning a city. There is also arts um, features that is related to Quran and the Sharia that links to gardens, how to set up gardens. And then there's your numerology, the, the science of numbers. And then the last one, the ninth one, is decorative art, which is basically, you know, tools and implements and materials and things like that. So those are the nine features of the art in Islam. And uh, we will be dealing only with the calligraphy. Now, why is calligraphy important? It's because, as we know from the Quran, is that the world came into existence by sound, by the Creator saying, kun fayakun. Be and it is. So by the fact that we were created by sound and the word and the letter, we then acquire our particular creativity through letters and sound. By in that way, we can transcend the corporeal self by actually presenting the work in terms of sound and letters. So the calligraphy is basically the base to take us away from the world into the other world. And each letter in Islam or in Arabic has a certain, a certain frequency that actually takes you onto another level. So if you recite the Quran or you read the Quran or you see the Quran, it goes past the mind and it hits the heart. And so it speaks to the heart. So basically within Islam, there are basically four features, two features in Islam that one can put, point out and that is the Creator is related to have said, the Prophet is related to have said that the Creator is the possessor of beauty and he loves beauty. So all art forms is basically a form of remembrance of God through beauty. So what you are looking at is actually a zikr, it's a remembrance of God in art form. So this, the arts in Islam is actually a Sufi order. You actually learn this from a sheikh for 14 years in the mountains. And then those particular sheikhs of the knowledge of the symbolism comes and they teach the craftsmen. So when you deal with the arts in Islam and calligraphy, you will, and we will, through the questioning of the artist, we will see how it affects them on another level. So hopefully I've given you a kind of a feature of it. The two features that you will see is reflection in the artwork. You will see balance and you'll see harmony. And you, what the, the four core feature of it is in multiplicity is unity and in unity is multiplicity. So those are the core features you'll see in the artwork. And the core feature of the artist is to remind the person of the creator and not of himself. So you find people who go into a mosque or look at a piece of artwork Sometimes they just cry because it goes past the mind into the heart. It vibrates the heart and you know that this is on a level of communication on truth and on absolute purity. And that's the vibrations that the art in actual fact brings to us through color, through letters and through sound. So I hope I've given you a, a little bit of, of, of insight in the short period so that when um, Mr. Sony Jr. presents his particular piece, then you can, in actual fact, some, somehow enjoy some of the work and see the actual 
impact it has on you. I hope I've done. Thank you, Doc. That was amazing. Thank you so Thank much. You, Shaheen? Do you want to move the podium a bit forward? Yeah. You can go. Sound okay? Okay. Okay. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for attending tonight's talk. I speak to you on behalf of myself, Shaheen Soni, and my dad, Ahmad Soni, tonight. Usually, I'm not the person that stands in front. For those of the, you that know me, I'm normally not the person that stands in front talking. But tonight, I make an exception because I get to tell the story of Sony Art. The story is from the perspective of two artists, my dad and myself, within the realm of Islamic art. We have a total of 58 years cumulative experience within the Islamic art uh, realm. Um, so let's first talk about Islamic art. What is Islamic art? So I've heard the word, the term used very loosely in the world, right? nationally and internationally. Islam basically is or means the submission to the will of God. Islam is an absolute system with the rules that are based on the Quran and the living example of the Prophet, which we call the Hadith. So what is Islamic art? Strictly speaking, Islamic art must be Islamic. So what does that mean? That means it must be derived from Quran and Hadith. But this is the perspective from a Muslim speaking. And I've also seen a definition for Islamic art, which is more of a cultural expression or the art of Muslims. I've seen it uh, that way as well. So that is um, basically the area that I am going to focus on today. That includes calligraphy, ornamentation, wood carving, fashion embroidery, metalwork, jewelry, architecture, etc. And I've broken it up into two main categories. The one is the traditional Islamic art and the contemporary Islamic art. Okay, so what is traditional Islamic art? In my opinion, calligraphy, Arabic calligraphy, but specifically the calligraphy of the Quran, the Word of God. That is the closest thing that I personally see as being Islamic art. It is the writing of the Word of God. There are various cultural expressions for calligraphy. The ones that I've seen mostly is Thuluth, Kufic, and Nasq. And these are reflective of the people and the regions where they come from. Uh, another aspect of uh, traditional uh, art in Islam I've seen is called tasib or ornamentation or illumination. So this is normally the, the, the pattern work that you'd see around calligraphic texts. Right? So it frames the calligraphy. The purpose is to raise the stature or illuminate the text. It's usually floral or geometric. Traditional schools follow methods that include naturally sourced materials such as bamboo pens, naturally derived inks, handmade papers, etc. The skills are taught on a master student, uh, in a master student relationship. Uh, skills are taught through repetition and the inward goal is excellence and perfection. There is also an element of spirituality in traditional Islamic art. Uh, Focus, repetitive actions brings about a meditative state of mind. So this is, I think, you're linking into what uh, Dr. Arnold had said earlier about the Sufi influence as well. Um, another form of traditional uh, art in Islam would be Ibru art, or water painting. Uh, this traditionally was used to decorate inner covers of Islamic texts. Okay? Um, so we can go over to the next slide. So we're going to talk about contemporary Islamic art. Or art in Islam uses elements from traditional Islamic art and expresses these in a contemporary manner. It's an abstract representation of Islamic art. Another aspect in, contempor in the contem contemporary realm is the use of symbolism. So symbolism has always been a very contentious issue within the Islamic art world, specifically the use of human forms. So some people are completely against it. And others believe that it is permissible as long as the intention of the artist and the nature of the work does not go against any Islamic principles. Uh, these types of artworks are usually, they usually include use of various mixed media. The styles are trendy and relevant and has a strong decor aspect. Uh, the freedom in expression allows the style to be more accessible and easier for people to follow. Okay, next slide. 
Okay, so back in 1982, 82, my dad was inspired to paint his very first Islamic artwork. It was whilst his regular Thursday night Quran recitation that he looked at the first page of the Quran. So that on the left is the actual Quran that he used. And you can see the artwork that he then created. Okay. Um, that moment of inspiration opened the door for Islamic art in South Africa. Ahmad Sony made his own methods or created his own methods for making traditional Islamic art. He applied Western painting methods and skills he had learned as a sign writer and painter. His strong sign writing background is evident in his use of line structure and form. Calligraphy was sketched rather than written. The use of a larger color palette and mixed media materials gave the artworks a more expressive form oils, acrylics on canvas rather than natural inks or handmade substrates. Okay, next slide. So we're going to go through a series of artworks by Ahmed Sony, And I've started out with the earlier ones, 1983, 1995. Right, next slide. Okay, so this is an artwork that was done in 1980, 1982, oil on canvas. This is something that was done on papyrus, banana leaf papyrus. This is the Asma Husna in Kufic script. Uh, next one. Because these are um, ornamental uh, designs with Arabic calligraphy as well. Notice, notice from the beginning till where we are now, the evolution of color as the artist evolves and art, the work changes as well. Uh, we can go forward. Also another beautiful artwork by Ahmad Sony, 2008. Okay, going forward, uh, something a little bit more recent. So the one on the left is something my dad just completed uh, recently in the last few weeks. And then the other one was 2013. We can move forward. So here we have something different. Okay, if you look at the slide over here, immediately you notice that the structure or the form in the artwork is not as, uh, like, like the previous artworks that I showed you. Um, you have Arabic calligraphy, but you have an abstract or gradient background with some texture paste. Here we start to see a more contemporary style of uh, the Islamic art. Uh, we can go forward. Uh, something, one on the left, that is an example of calligraphy. Notice how the simplicity in the color works well with the complexity of the calligraphy in that artwork. And then the one on the right, 2002, there's no Arabic calligraphy in that artwork at all. Everything is ornamentation. We can go forward. Uh, the one on the left is a uh, idol kursi, which is a Kufic script. Uh, my dad used a lot of mixed media in that uh, artwork, so you can't see it in the picture, but all those lettering and pattern work is raised. The one next to that demonstrates a very ethnic interpretation. If you look at the, the, the style of the pattern and the colors as well, there's a very ethnic uh, feeling to it. Okay. Then again, the one on the left, immediately you will notice the Indibele style pattern work inspired by that. Um, and then the one on the right also, as well also has a bit of uh, ethnic uh, pattern work in it as well. Okay, now we start with uh, my paintings. Okay, so the, the one on the left is my first painting. That's the first one I did. Not the very first painting, but the first painting I did as a painter uh, attempting uh, Islamic art or the world of uh, art in Islam. It was back in 2001. And then as we, we go to the right, you see oil on canvas. That again is an ethnic, uh, bit of an ethnic pattern. You can move forward. Also one of my artworks, uh, Idol Kursi, again. Uh, notice that um, the, in the previous slide, you saw there was a lot of structure in my work, and this is the influence that my dad had on me. I grew up in a home surrounded by his art. Initially, I did uh, uh, try to emulate his work by uh, including all that structure, but later on, as I start to move forward, I start to develop my own style as well. So here, I started to use English as well. So the Arabic text is there, but the English is alongside as well. So I start to look at an audience which is not just Muslim. I want everyone to be able to interpret and appreciate the artwork. We move forward. Okay, this is just some commissions. So I enjoy uh, doing commissions for, for private homes. We can go forward. 
Okay, so these paintings over here, these are, I make two types of paintings. I do two types of artwork. The one is a artwork that is commissioned by a client, and I make it according to their preferences, but then I also enjoy making my own artwork, which are things and ideas that I feel very strongly about. So these are uh, an example of two paintings that I've done in that, uh, with that uh, way of thinking. I put myself in my artwork always. It's always a very personal statement. Uh, very little calligraphy in the artwork, again, but the concept is Islamic. You know, I'm, I'm trying to, to, to tell a story, basically. I want my artwork to be able to appeal to a greater audience, to people who we, we, we all don't, I mean, not all Arabic speakers, and we all don't understand Arabic. So I want the artwork to actually have a longer range, you know, to be able to, to inspire or maybe tell the story to people uh, who don't understand Arabic as well. So that is the idea behind these artworks. We can go forward. Um, okay, so this is where I start to introduce digital artwork into what I do. So because of my IT background, um, it was natural for me to start using the computer uh, software to, to create artworks. Also, uh, on the left, you can see there's an indication of some symbolism being used there as well. But you always have to be very careful, like uh, Dr. Arnold was saying, the use of symbolism, you have to be very careful with that. Um, so, so these are examples of digital artworks. You can go forward. Again, here, we have some digital art as well. The one on the left follows a more traditional uh, style. You can see the illumination or the ornamentation that, that is around Surah Yasin, and that is a complete Surah Yasin. And then on the one on the right is an example of um, a more contemporary style of uh, art with uh, Surah Fatiha. Okay, we can move forward. Uh, something that I've also uh, done is um, I've started to use uh, software to do some laser cutting. So with the technology, with the advent of technology and laser cutting become more readily available, we can cut metal, stainless steel, aluminum, perspex. Okay, we can go forward. We can move forward. So the, the, the same idea or the same technology is used also then on wood as well. So these are uh, laser bent designs that are done on rustic panels. You can move forward. Perspex as well. So on top we have an example of uh, uh, vinyl on perspex. We have laser cut perspex and we also have printing onto perspex as well. Okay. Okay, so now we start to talk about uh, the masjids or the artworks that was done by my dad um, in, in, in masjids. So in 1990, uh, 1988, Masjid al-Quds in Gatesville, it was first commissioned mass project by Ahmad Sony. Took him nine months to complete. The only dome painted in oils. Now I find that very, very uh, interesting. That's only one dome that was ever painted in oils. It is approximately, if you look at the circumference of the dome, that is basically the artwork that we're talking about. Approximately 10 meter diameter, height is about 1.2 meters. So quite an extensive artwork. Right? It was done part-time while still employed in the Simonstown uh, dockyard. Uh, generally, the mosque artworks would include the uh, dome circumferences, complete dome areas, mihrab, and flat wall surfaces. Materials used include oils, acrylics, inks on canvas, perspex, wood, and stainless steel. We can move forward. These are examples of dome perimeters. So uh, these are two domes that my dad did. The one is at the Habibi Sufi Mosque. The other one is at Masjid Furqan, Islamia. You can move forward. Uh, dome area. Right? So this is where we cover the entire dome surface, the, the, the concave surface. Um, as you can see in the middle, it is segmented. The artwork is segmented and then assembled into the dome. Okay. This is mihrab. So mihrab is basically normally the front of the mosque. So it is like the focal point. Uh, the one in the middle is a project that I worked with my dad on. That was laser cut wood uh, stained and mounted into the mihrab. One on the left on top is perspex. One at the bottom is painted. Uh, one on the top right is uh, Mitchell's Plain Town Center. And then the one at the bottom right is the Boranul Masjid uh, in district. I mean in Bokab, sorry. 
Okay, next one. So these are some flat surfaces that uh, we've also done in pre-buildings. The top one, University of Cape Town, Cape Town International Airport. The one on the right, Chris Barnard, Netke Hospital. They had a prayer room and they wanted us to, to create some artwork for the prayer room. And then uh, Masjid Furqan at the bottom left. And the one in the middle is actually a milestone project for my dad. It was the 70th masjid that he had accomplished. He had done, he's done 70 mosques in our country and, and uh, beyond the borders of our country as well. Okay. Um, okay, so this is also something very unusual but interesting, right? So my dad was asked, you, you saw the Gatesville Mosque, uh, the first slide of the, of the dome. So this is the outside area of that dome on the roof. My dad was asked to do a mosaic on the outside of the dome. And uh, that was the result. You can see the inspiration is uh, Masjid al-Aqsa in Palestine. And we can move forward. Okay, so this is also the same masjid again, but inside in, in the prayer area or adjacent to the front doors where you enter the prayer area. These are porcelain tiles that were painted and baked. This is something he did, uh, when was it? 1997. There are two of these panels that are still in the masjid. Okay, we can move on. Sorry, I forgot to mention that it wasn't just my dad. It was actually Amina Raut as well. She was the lady that assisted my dad with uh, the, the baking of the tiles and managing that process. Okay, so the Owal Masjid. So this one is, in my opinion, an honor. You know, my dad is given the honor of putting his art into the Owal Masjid. The Owal Masjid is the oldest masjid in South Africa, 1794. So for my dad, I, I think this is one of, one of the greatest honors that, that is to have his work in there, alhamdulillah. Okay, so I took this out of my dad's album in his handwriting. These are his 70 masjids that he's accomplished. And I think rightfully so, I'm proud of him. You know, it's, it's quite an accomplishment what he's, what he's achieved. Okay, so the artworks can be found in prayer buildings, right, masjids, private homes, and even private business premises as well, nationally and internationally. Okay, so now we'll talk a little bit about the exhibitions. So we've been fortunate enough to exhibit our artwork nationally throughout South Africa. Uh, in 1994, my dad was invited to attend the first um, exhibition in Pakistan, his first international exhibition in Pakistan. It was only after sanctions were lifted and he was able to establish a relationship with an organization called Irsika in uh, Turkey, Istanbul. And uh, due to that relationship, we've maintained that over the years. And we were fortunate enough to, you see, my dad has been to quite a few countries and I was honored enough to wow, have the opportunity to visit Istanbul and Iran as well. But really it was an honor, you know, uh, for me and my dad, I'm sure it was an honor because whenever we we attended these uh, exhibitions, we were always um, representing South Africa. So you see the shirt that I got on? It's actually my dad's shirt. <laughs> so all the exhibitions that we attend, we wear the shirt to represent South Africa. We call it our Mandela shirt. <laughs> okay, next slide. Nice so these exhibitions usually involve a group of about 30 to 50 or sometimes even more artisans from across the world. Um, they, normally the exhibition event or the program is broken up into three main categories or uh, sections. The one is an academic congress. So this is where academics come and they uh, submit papers about the current topic you know, that the exhibition is about. So they'll write papers and they'll come and present that uh, at the event. Then you also have the exhibition. So the exhibition takes the form of an artist's village. Each artist, like I said, about 30 to 50 artisans, each artist would get a three by three cubicle. It's, it's an artist at workstation. You display your work, you interact with the public, and you can also retail as well. And then the last aspect is the competition. So they also have judges, and these judges will go around and they will award certain people uh, for their effort in the exhibition and for their work as well. Okay, next slide. Okay. So our participation allowed us exposure to other international cultural forms of Islamic art, which is very valuable for us. Networking and sharing and creating good friendships with other artisans from across the world. 
But one thing that became very apparent from our participation at these events is that visually our works emulated the works coming from other various Islamic countries. As South African Muslims, we needed a unique visual identity. We needed our own voice in Islamic art. This expression should reflect our diverse peoples and region. It is a conversation that requires a very broad and diverse collaboration. But I think South Africa, we are quite young, you know, in terms of Islamic art. And if I look at the, if I, okay. If I look at the enthusiasm and interest in Islamic art, I'm confident that in time, we will see this unique visual identity evolving in time, inshallah. Okay, next one. Okay, just something interesting. We were asked to be part of the Baz Art uh, International Public Mural Festival in Salt River. That was, I think, two years ago, 2018. Uh, the IPAF theme that year was Education and the Future. So we decided to take a text from the Quran, Iqara, Bismi Rabbika Alladhi Khalaq. Um, simply because what we had noticed in our society in the last 10 years, there's been a renewed enthusiasm for um, learning about the Quran, especially amongst the young people. So we thought that would be a good way to go. And it was very well received by the community as well. It was a very interesting, very enjoyable project. First, uh, my first mural. The project was done by myself and my then partner. Okay, then we can move on. We talk a little bit about technology. So technology has also started to affect uh, the work uh, uh, made by uh, artists uh, in the Islamic uh, realm. Computer science obviously played a big role for me. As technology improved, I could apply my skills, my painting skills, by clicking a mouse. I followed the same approach as a painter uh, when I built digitally. And this, I think, gives my artwork uh, more of an authentic painted feeling. Uh, these laser cutting technology, it's also available today, and we use that to create 3D Islamic uh, artworks uh, that can be done in wood, perspex, steel, or aluminium. Technology has also brought about the ability to reproduce original uh, artworks, and this has made art more accessible and more affordable to people. Okay, we can move on. Teaching. Okay, so one of the most fulfilling activities for me is teaching. Right. We have devised, between my dad and myself, we have devised an introductory step-by-step -step program for teaching our methods to adults and children. Uh, we've taken this nationally with hundreds of eager novice painters going through our classes. Art is also a great tool for social upliftment. We are fortunate enough to teach and demonstrate our methods to underprivileged Model C type schools. And even my dad has visited the Victor Vista prison facility to, to teach. Some of our students have, in fact, continued to improve their skills and are now selling their works. Um, this, I believe, has been a driving force in the popularity of local Islamic art in, in our community. It is also a sign of an emerging market. Galleries specializing in Islamic art have also emerged across the country, although small in number at present. And social media and online business has also added a growth uh, to this area or this market. Can move on. We also had the opportunity to, to do some significant uh, workshops with people. Um, on the top right you, or in the center, you'll see we had the opportunity to do an art workshop with the Tamimi family from Gaza. So this was um, arranged by the late uncle Anwar Nagia and the Okaf team. Uh, we are very grateful for that opportunity to be able to spend time with us, with this family. And as we know, they, the situation at the moment is very difficult, and we pray and hope that they stay safe. So this taught us, or showed me, how valuable art could be in telling the story of injustice and how art collaborations could amplify expression. Sharing of art culture can create social adhesion, can bring people together. If we move forward, it's so just again about technology. So COVID, uh, changed a lot of things, especially for me as an artist, changed the environment that I was working in. And um, so I've managed to uh, do this workshop with a bunch of expats from across the world. And uh, yeah, just another example of how technology can be used uh, to facilitate uh, art. We move forward. Okay, so now we start talking about Safia. 
So Safia is short for South African Foundation of Islamic Art. So having faced many challenges in trying to make a living from Islamic art, we realized that a collaborative effort would be far more effective. In early 2000s, a few Islamic art fans sat down and we started discussing a more formal approach to sustaining Islamic art in South Africa. We registered an NPO called the South African Foundation of Islamic Art, Safia. The organization has since evolved in management and also now includes uh, oversight of a trustee board. Some of the goals or main goals of the organization was to establish Islamic art in our country as well as to join the national art dialogue. So tonight is a very, for me, very exciting because this is exactly what that is. Uh, Islamic art finding is the opportunity uh, to show what we are about at this platform, on this, uh, in this forum, this level. So uh, very, very excited about tonight. Uh, we also enjoyed two showings at the Cape Town Art Fair which is also uh, very exciting. Our membership has increased to 72. Skills range from painting, calligraphy, wood carving, metalwork, sketching, sculpturing, embroidery, and various other mixed media art forms. Safia currently has a showing on at the gallery situated at Kromboom Gardens. It is in Crawford area above the spa. Uh, can move on. Okay, just very quickly. Um, so art is not something, uh, I've discovered that art, you don't sell art every day. So I've come up with a series of products. And these products are ready to paint canvases, Arabic stencils, 3D woodcuts. And then also on the right is the Ahmad Sony collection. So these are A5 or miniature artworks, desktop artworks. We can move on. Okay. So back in 1982, Ahmad Sony was completely isolated in what he was doing. No one had ever seen his style of work, and very few people understood the value of art in society. Also, due to the then sanctions, he was cut off from the outside world. It was only through his perseverance and his ambition that we are here tonight. Right, we have a website. There's also a biographical book on the life of Ahmad Sony that was uh, published, Portrait of an Islamic Artist. The book was authored by my aunt, uh, Zaitun Abed. She is sitting over here. And uh, it is available at bookstores. So lastly, I would just like to say that I'm honored to say that I've played a role in the story. I hope in time more and more people from all backgrounds will start to see the value in Islamic art. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Shaheen. Thank you so much for the informative presentation. So what we're going to do now is open... For, uh, Dr. Arnold, you're going to start the conversation. But mm. first, we're going to cue a video. And then we're going to bring Mr. Ahmad Sony into the conversation as well. After which, the floor will be open to the audience while q and I'll handle the roving mic. So I'll be moving between you guys, distributing the mic accordingly. Over to you, Doc. I firstly, I, I, I must congratulate uh, um, Mr. Ahmad Sony Sr. and Jr for an excellent presentation, and I think it's exactly what we all came here for, to become inspired and to, to appreciate another form of art. I must thank the curator and the staff that have made this possible and have opened up a new dimension of appreciation with the beginning of the calligraphy and, uh, and yourself that have come out in such an evening of, of rain, et cetera, to support this, which shows the amount of power that this kind of work has. And you can see that as well. So uh, Dr. Satai, if you can display this short clip okay. of a 20-year video I made <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, 20 Dr. years ago. <laughs> and so you see. Uh, Mr. Ahmad Sony, 20 years ago. Thank you. Over to you, Belinda. In my death, I will for Allah, the cherisher and sustainer of the world. And uh, for our first um, Islamic artist, I'd like to interview the artist of this beautiful piece of work. Assalamu alaikum. Haji Ahmad Sawni. Shukran for um, 
giving us such a real valuable, valuable time um, to have an interview with you as an Islamic artist. Um, could you, would you be so kind to um, tell us perhaps what was the what was the main inspiration that brought you into this particular world? Um, my main inspiration came in 1982. Um, prior to that, I was always an artist. I was always painting. Uh, I was in Western art, so for Western art painting, people painting landscapes, flowers. I was always doing art, and then in 1982, I um, my mother was reading the Quran, and when I opened the Quran, I saw the first page, and I thought to myself, uh, "Wanna paint this?" And uh, I did it, and since that time, I've been inspired by pattern work, the calligraphy, everything as a whole combination that really inspires me every time. But I truly believe that my inspiration comes from a higher source. I'm inspired by what I and I just can't stop painting. I just paint a little bit So if, if one looks at your beautiful piece of work you're busy with now, Haji Ahmad, could you perhaps tell us Roughly, how long does a piece of work like this take for you? A uh, piece of work like this would take approximately about six to seven weeks uh, to, to, from start to finish. I have done one that took me about three months to complete. It depends on the details that I put into it and the size of the painting. And uh, is, is Ahmad Sony, as Ahmad Sony, as we were called in Buddha Ahmad? You can see that 20 years ago, um, Mr. Sony was already busy and producing this work. My first question to Mr. Sony was, is, would be, how do you manage to sustain the quality of your work over these years? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And good evening. I put my trust only in God. Wallah, you won't believe me. I paint every day, and I get inspired every day to paint. There's not a day that goes by that I don't paint. It's a very emotional thing for me, because I believe it's more divine inspiration than anything else. Since 1982, when I started, I think I've done more than a thousand paintings. Mashallah, and each one is different. Beautiful. And when I finish one, then the next one is already in my head. Wonderful. I've, I'm finishing one off, maybe Monday. I know already the next one, what I'm going to do. Wow. I get inspired, I don't know how, but I just paint. That's all I do. Beautiful. I'm a simple man, no education, hardly any education. Haven't been trained in art. But I paint for the love of it. Yeah. And I paint to beautify the word of God. Mm. That's all I do. So I got no reason why, or no, I can't explain to you why I paint, or what's the reason for me doing what I'm doing. But all I know is that it's Godly inspired. That's all. Beautiful. There is, a, there is an ayah in the Quran where Allah says that everything good comes from Him, and only evil comes from us. So there's an ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if you are encouraged to do something good, do not hesitate. And for myself, I've applied it. You get the assistance from the unseen world. Because when you finish, I'm sure, Mr. Sony, when you look at your work, you say, is that me? Did I do this? Do you have that kind of feeling? Definitely, you know, when I, when I finish a mosque, then I look at the mosque and I say, Ya Allah, did I create that? You know, and, and, and you, want, you, you know, I started doing masjids in 1989. When I did my first mosque, it was in Gatesville, Gatesville Mosque. I spoke to God. I said, don't let us be the last or the first one. Mm-hmm. And as true as, you know, God is faithful to me, I did 70 masjids wow. after that. Mm-hmm. And I don't think any other person has ever done that. Oh. 70 masjids is a lot of masjids. Is a Man alone, from the beginning, from painting the canvases, from drawing out, from fitting, 
man alone, every stroke on that canvas oh, as one man. And I don't know how I got a, the, the inspiration to do this type of thing. But I just thank my God for, for motivating me. Beautiful. Thank you very much. I, your, your words and your, your heart is in it to the level that I hope that it will transcend beyond yourself into everyone else. That will be one of my questions later on. And uh, so I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Sony Jr. Shukran, it was inspiring those, uh, that answer. Okay, what, so what makes you continue? Uh, don't say your father now because I'm mm. going to ask that question later on. Yeah. I want to speak about yourself. What makes you go into this kind of work? Because what I can see and what everybody else can see, uh, you need an enormous amount of patience. No, definitely. Um, so my story starts like I didn't initially intend to become an artist. Um, academic studies was uh, in line of computer science. Ended up working in IT for about seven years. The last stint or contract that I had was out in the Netherlands. But also keeping in mind that I grew up around art. So from a young age, there was always paint, paint brushes and stuff in the home. Right. And the art culture in Holland was also very rich. Right. And I started painting. And on my return from the Netherlands, I, since, since I walked into IT, I didn't feel comfortable. Even though I was successful, I was, I was able to do a good job. It just never it didn't fit you know, for me. My daughter was born in the Netherlands, first child. Mm -hmm. And that experience, I think, uh, changed some of my views on life. Um, I realize you only have one life, and do what you're passionate about. Why would you do something else that you, you I, I'd be better if I did something if I was passionate about it than if I was just doing it as a job. So, so that was some of the motivating factors um, for me to, to enter into the art world. I do, I do see that your computer science skills have infiltrated into the arts of Islam, yes. which I think all of us would like to learn how to do that. Yeah. Because now, you know, every step of our way has been planned by the Creator. Mm -hmm. So that skill of yours and the qualifications has actually transformed yes. the work that we can do on calligraphy, etc. And I'm sure yeah. many of us would want to just register with you and say, how do you do this? Yeah. So, so I would thank you for having qualified as a, okay. as a computer scientist <laughs> yeah. because you brought another angle to the artwork. Alhamdulillah. Now I'm going to ask both of you one question that you both have to answer, and that is, what piece of work is close to your heart that you will never sell? <laughs> well, <laughs> that you really you said this is my piece. You know, I'm not departing mm. with that. That is here. Well, my very first painting that I did in 1980, 1982, I still got that painting. Alhamdulillah. And that is my, the one that I want to sell. But if you can ask me which one is my favorite, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to ask you which child of yours is the favorite. Allah, yeah. <laughs> beautiful answer, beautiful answer, mashallah. That is true. Every piece of artwork is close to us. And the first well, one is normally the one that, that, that yeah. gives us a trajectory. For yourself. Uh, okay, so for me, a little bit different. So. Um, all my artwork are like my children, and because my artwork is so personal, my personal uh, I make personal statements in my artwork. Right. I'm very attached to them, so even though I sell them, they still mine. Right. You know, I still have that idea that they <laughs> I mine, like that. I and like I can that. see pictures of them whenever I, I, I want. Like you that. know, I like that. I so, am, the, uh, so the guy who buys it never owns it. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah, in my in my mind, that's how it works. <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, you, you're transcending but. space and time. <laughs> But yeah, I have a very personal relationship with my art. My favorite artwork is always the one that I'm currently busy with because that's where I have the most excitement, right, the right. most ideas. I'm very passionate about it. Um, so that for me, um, yeah, that, that would be my favorite or my most, uh, the, the one that I feel most for is the one that I'm currently busy with. Beautiful. I like that answer. Yeah. I like that answer. Because each one, you, it's like the Sufis say, grab the moment and you gain the strength of the hour. Grab the hour and you win the day. Grab the day and you win the month. And so they go on, you know. The moment is the most important because yeah. the past is gone, the future we don't know. Yeah. That moment is the most perfect point. 
that the Creator has given us to be grateful for yeah. and to actually transcend in that particular moment. Thank you very much. I think okay. it's a beautiful <laughs> answer to that question. Now I want to ask Daddy, how do you feel having a son that has taken over the baton from you at your age now, looking at him and seeing what he's done? How do you feel as a father? Uh, to be honest with you, I was a bit disappointed because <laughs> <laughs> there's, hardly, there's hardly any money in art. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can't make a living with art. <laughs> but it's his passion, and I, I agree with him. If he wants to, he must follow his passion, right. and I wish him well. <laughs> I, I I never expected such a perfectly <laughs> honest answer. <laughs> Well, I mean, honestly, about it, yeah. <laughs> but as we know, you know, sometimes the little that we earn has got so much more barakah in, so much more blessing than, than earning a lot of money. So God has a better plan, you know. I think God has a better plan for Yes, us. absolutely. Yeah, and and you're not going to get a little bit more of your rizq that is for your yeah. moment. Yeah. You're only going to get that which you must get. Mm. And the basic, and I think the hadith that says, that the understanding of it, the rich person is the one who's contented. Mm. Not that he sits and do nothing, but he's contented and, and, and welcomes what he, where he is and enjoy the moment. To yourself, how is it like, what is it like to have a father <laughs> of this kind of iconic sta status? I know, it's simple. Um, it's an honor for me to be All the right. son of Ahmed Sony. Um, as far as me following in my dad's footsteps, you know, I always tell people that I, I prefer to carve my own path. Right. right? So I don't want to be Ahmed Sony. I don't think anyone can achieve being Ahmad Sony. If you look at the body of work that my dad has done, um, I don't know how to use the word crazy, to sit and paint like that all the time. <laughs> my dad is really, really uh, exceptional in that regard. He paints Monday to Sunday, I'm today there. still, at 73 years old. I, I, I. So I don't even want to attempt to try and emulate my dad because <laughs> I don't think I can do it. I, I can try to help you, yeah. <laughs> There is, there is three ways of doing something. You can do something with your body, and then you get tired. You can do something with your soul, and then you get irritated. You get something with your spirit of God inside of you, you are never tired. You never actually work. You don't even know how the time went. Mm. But that energy of the spirit inside of us is on another level. So you have to choose, and I think your father has chosen. I work with the roh, with the spirit of Allah. And that just transcends time and space. Okay. If you take it from a body perspective, you will always be tired. If you mm. take it from a soul perspective, you will be irritated. <laughs> but take it from a roh perspective, you'll never get tired. You'll just continuously doing it. So I want to add something, you know, like they get mad with me because I work in a disciplined fashion. Right. right. When I start off past seven, I take a break from ten to quarter past ten. Lovely, lovely. Every day, I don't change my tea time. Beautiful. Here. Beautiful. And Be I take my lunch from half past 12 to quarter past 1. Beautiful. Because Every day. And uh, they don't understand that if you're not disciplined, you can't do Islamic art. Absolutely. If you are not your own boss, you'll never get anywhere. you never get anywhere. And this is the, a perfect example of being your own boss. Mm -hmm. Time frames. You discipline yourself. Discipline and yourself. you enjoy it, actually. And it's, Islamic art is a very disciplined art. Absolutely. Form. It's just really repeat, sober. You, you have to repeat yourself. Yes. Several times, and you, if you're not disciplined, you're not going to achieve it. Absolutely. So, what I want to ask you now uh, is basically now away from yourself in terms of your service to the community. Um, look at the Safia as the South African Foundation for Arts. What would you say is uh, a core feature that you would like to aim at? with this particular foundation? I know you said something in terms of your presentation, but is mm. there something that you didn't say that you would like to share with us at the moment? Well, we'd like to see um, Islamic art flourishing, you know, or arts of Islam uh, flourishing in the country. So that is the goal of Sophia, to create that environment, uh, to spread um, the, the value of the different types of the crafts and the arts throughout South Africa. And also, like I said in the, the talk, that we also want to be part of the national dialogue when it comes to arts as well. Right. We want it to be inclusive. We want to be able to share. Um, that, that is basically, uh, from my point of view, that that is the goal. And Dad, uh, how do you feel? I feel exactly the same, you know, that we, we got to represent South Africa as 
Isla there's Islamic art in South Africa as well. Not just mm. other art form, there's Islamic art as well. And we got to bring it to, to the wider community and not just the Muslims. All right. We got to spread the art around and show people what we all about. I think what you just touched on is something that uh, some of the museums are having a problem with, is that they say, how can we say it's Islamic art where there are also non-Muslims who are producing that art? Mm. So they're now going into the concept of the arts of Islam. Mm. Because there are many people who are not Muslim who are producing similar work and are excited about that work. And that probably is the difference between Islamic art and arts in Islam. Yeah. Because Islamic art basically is just a 19th century Western kind of terminology when mm. it's brought onto the scene. Mm. But the arts in Islam is basically pre reflecting the creator. And the why reflection is used in arts in Islam is because the Sufis say that whatever you see and whatever you experience is a reflection of the 99 attributes of the creator. So if you see power, that is p the creator is powerful. If you see light, the creator is light. And for us, the 99 attributes is inside of us, and it depends on what we're going to bring out of it. So if I, if I may ask uh, uh, a kind of a, a, a last question, um, could, I, could I say that, that, could we in actual fact say that we can take the art in Islam as saying, and I want you to comment on this, can we, can we call it the creative expression of reflections of the divine? Can we, can we use that as a kind of a way to promote it? I'm going to say it again. Art of Islam. Creative expression yeah. of the reflections of Islam. How do you, how would you, creative expression of reflections of Islam? Yeah, that, that does sound like a good description. Um, that does make sense to me. Because basically, um, if you look at uh, the arts that are pr produced, um, they are inspired by Islam. That's basically what you're saying. Inspired yeah. by concepts and ideas within the Islamic system. Right. Yeah, so based on that, I, I agree with you. Dad? I agree with him as well. Uh, nothing to add. I, I'm, I'm very grateful. I think you have presented the answers on a level that we did not expect because it's extremely truthful. And I think at this particular moment in time, I'd like to hand over to Dr. Satai to uh, carry on and introduce the audience uh, uh, question. Okay, thank you, Doc. It's a bit earlier than expected, but I think it's a good opportunity for the audience to join the discussion. I know there's a a familiar face in the in the crowd, Ashraf, who did the signage <laughs> for the museum, right? If you want to, do you want to, would you like to join the discussion? Oh, over there, okay. I'm gonna give you the mic. It's cool. Can I get some sanitizer, please? Oh, thank you, Michael. Can you hear me? Asalaamu As Alaikum. Thank you so much for that. was absolutely wonderful. My question actually is for Zaitz, um, and also, you know, I hope Ahmed, uh, Uncle Ahmed, you'll join me in this. Um, I would be interested to know whether Zaitz would consider having a retrospective of um, Uncle Ahmed's uh, work. And I would be interested to know if Ahmed, if you would be interested in perhaps taking up residency in Zaitz. Uh, for a period of time, and I would be really interested to hear that conversation. Because I would say that um, listening to everything and seeing everything and learning everything that I have here, that um, Ahmed Sony is really a master amongst us and I think would really deserve to be able to have that conversation with the rest of the community. Thank you so much. My first in inclination is to say yes, absolutely. We've got an atrium here <laughs> that could really... <laughs> You know, yeah, like, look beautiful with your work. That's my first inclination. But Storm, would you like to join the conversation? <laughs> Storm is a Yeah. But thank you for the question. Thank you so much. And, um, and also for the prompt and, and um, kind of getting this conversation going. I just want to say from my side, I'm Storm Janssen von Rensburg. I'm senior curator at the museum and also head of curatorial affairs. Um, just thank you so much for the incredible contribution um, that is for many of us in the art world not visible. 
um, and a very particular art world. And I think our exhibition upstairs on the third floor, Homeless Where the Art Is, was an invitation to Cape Tonians to claim home in the museum. And if in some ways this is becoming a reality, then I think this is extraordinary. Um, I would love to have a conversation about the future and see how we can support your work. Um, it comes with, I think, also a way for us to think about how we consider contemporary production and making and thinking and discourse. Um, but all I can do right now is really thank you for your contribution. Um, and also, it is a revelation to me, and it shouldn't. Um, but thank you again. I'm, we are here to be educated and learn more. And thank you for your generosity then also and bringing it to us and our audiences. Thank you, thank you so much, Tom. Mr. Ahmad, would you like to say something to that? I would like to thank Zais for giving me the opportunity of exposing my work to, to, to a wider audience. And I will gladly participate in any future uh, exhibitions that you're planning. Thank you very much. We've got another question here from Lando Glamini. Thanks. Um, so when I walked in here, um, you, Doctor, you were saying something so beautifully. So I've always been very interested in, in, in religious and everything. Um, you said something about when you when you read the Quran and you keep on reading it, it starts speaking to your kind of inner self, and that really just got me thinking of what 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 what's the what's the right way? Like what's what's like. Obviously, we hear from different religions pretty much kind of the same kind of thing. My, I guess my question is, which, which, which is the right one? Which, like, which one is the right one? How does one know that you are following kind of the right path now? Okay, as you know, that is a religious question. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't know whether I'm, I'm, I'm free in this particular feature to answer that question. But I can say um, sincerity of the heart is, is the indication of where the truth lies, not the mind. So if you really want to get somewhere, clear the mind and let the heart speak. And it will guide you to because it has been endowed with the truth. And it will take you to the circumstances, to the artwork, to the books, to the activities that will bring you closer to your actual heart requirement not your mind. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Doc. We've got a question here at the back. Hi, thank you so much for that uh, beautiful presentation. Um, Shaheen, correct me if I'm wrong, but your daughter's artwork is on the third floor, right? Yes, that's correct. And I was just curious to know um, how it was for her to respond to Zeitzmarker's call and what, what it's meant for her to exhibit among so many other artworks. Um, it's always nice to hear how uh, people who entered that exhibition responded. Yeah. And of course, she's also like third generation now learning Beautiful. from you guys. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah, so Iman, uh, you. okay, you want to speak? No, I'll just say thank you, Tanazania, assistant curator, Zaz Thank okay. you. Over to you, Shane. Sorry. Okay, so uh, Iman's artwork is upstairs. Um, Iman created that artwork uh, as a project while she was at Weinberg, Weinberg Girls uh, High School. It was part of a final year uh, matric uh, project that she did. Um, she incorporated a bit of her uh, own personal story in it. I was actually very proud of the painting. You know, it's a very daring, very uh, open, uh, opening herself up basically uh, in expression to, to what she's trying to say in the artwork. So I'm proud of her for having her artwork here in, in, in Zeismarke, which is obviously, obviously uh, quite an achievement uh, for any person uh, who is a painter. Um, yeah, so I don't know, does that answer your question? Okay. Thank you, Shaheen. We've got another question here for you. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome, salam. Shukran so much to you both and Mr. Arnold for presenting this to us. And what I want to know is, um, have you identified any public spaces to do specific works or is there any chance to do things like that like you said to bring things out on a much yeah. broader scale and expose them so yeah. as an idea unless you've already considered it to actually find key points in the city where along with maybe other budding artists whatever yeah. 
but to do things like this and like really present it on a large scale, if only yeah. five key points or something like that. Yeah. You know? And then the second question, if I may use the opportunity, is with everything happening, I actually came across this event due to looking at um, protest art and things like that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the Palestinian issue and other issues. So, with that maybe as a theme, with protest art specifically, you know, including your art along with if verses from the Quran and other religious works to just, you know, get that in where we are almost impotent against all this crazy stuff happening, the Palestinian yeah. issue, and we feel almost useless, but just to make it like, say, a humanitarian issue and yeah. using art as a platform. Yes, no, definitely. Art is a good vehicle for that. Is art. art has always been a good vehicle, especially if you look at the workshop we did with the Tamimi family from Gaza. That was a few years ago at the Palestinian Center in town. That was exactly that type of event where we tried to create awareness about the, uh, the condition of the people in Gaza. So the family came and we did an art workshop. And they created a series of artworks which were later used um, in, in publications, I think. But... Um, Definitely the conversation with the public is very important. So tonight is also very important. Uh, um, with COVID coming, we, we did something as a mural, which is a public artwork in Salt River. It was a couple of years ago. We were asked to do something in Abibia Primary School as well. And there's a few mural projects that people have been talking about. But with COVID, everything had to, um, had, has to wait, unfortunately, till everything clears up. But the, the, the conversation with the public is very important, and that's something that we, we need to maintain and keep doing. We can't, uh, like we've got a, a gallery at the moment, um, the Safia Gallery, which is above the spa in, in, in Crawford as well. So people are welcome to go and have a look and see what's happening over there. Um, but our efforts are always to try to create more public dialogue. And if Islamic art or arts in Islam can facilitate that, I'm for it, definitely. Any initiative like that, I'll grab onto it. Uh, is it uh, um, I'm a self-taught calligrapher, and uh, I have attended workshops presented by some top calligraphers around the world, and I'm curious about your own uh, experience in that regard. To which extent are the two of you uh, self-taught? To which extent have you studied under some other masters? Okay. For example, um, a Iranian calligrapher by the name of, I think his name is Bachman Pahini, has come to uh, the Cape Town on a regular basis. Have you studied under him? Um, yeah, and what's it like yeah. being mostly self-taught? I get the impression that b both of you are most Okay, for, for, from my point of view, as an artist, I don't see myself as a calligrapher. So I don't exercise the skill of calligraphy. Um, I, I use calligraphy written by people knowledgeable enough to create calligraphy. Um, um, whereas my dad is different. My dad is able to, he's, he's adapted or he's created a very unique skill. He's able to sketch calligraphy and paint it. Um, very, uh, just to watch him do it he, he is awesome, just to see him do that. Um, sorry, what was the other part of the question? Oh, I was asking if you've studied under other oh, studied any masters. Under, no, so I don't, uh, uh, traditional forms, if you look at, um, we've been to Tabriz, uh, the University of Tabriz, and you can see the, the traditional school normally um, as a master and a student, you know, and that is the structure of the education. Uh, but I did not attend traditional schools for Islamic art. Um, so I come more as an artist um, I, I'm more of an artist in that sense than an uh, Islamic calligrapher. Although the, the stories I tell and the concepts and ideas that I present uh, are uh, Islamic. They, they have an Islamic source. Uh, maybe my dad would be able to, to, to say something different. Uh, I'm exactly the same. You know, I haven't studied any under any calligrapher. I'm self-taught and uh, I, I adapted the style to suit the, the, the skill of man, and that's about it. But I have met other calligraphers throughout the world, and I've taken note of how they do their work, and I, I admire them for doing it. But that is not in me. I'm, I'm more of a brush person. I paint with, I do calligraphy with the brush and not with the pen. For, for the work that I do, I need to work with the brush. So I adapt myself to doing calligraphy with the brush and not with the pen. Thank you. I have a Thank question you. for 
Dr. Arnold. Yes, my son. Can you please tell us more about your practice as a holistic educator and how you integrate the arts in your educational practice? Um, what I basically did was is to look at the Quran and to look at how well the, what does the Quran actually present to us because most of the features of education is based on what state tells you how to train a teacher and how to educate a person and how to run a lesson, etc. But what is missing is the value of learning. And again, as, as the artists are inspired, I was inspired at the moment to actually see seven activities that integrate everything. And the seven activities are nature, people, languages, trade, calculation, construction, and microscopic and telescopic. All those particular seven activities are integrated and it actually runs, it follows each other. So people are part of nature, language is part of people, trade is another form of language, calculation is necessary for trade, construction is a result of calculation, and everything in the microscopic and telescopic world is constructed. And if you look at anything that you want to draw, or you want to paint, or you want to interact with, if you can say what is the natural aspect of it, and you ask yourself those questions, you integrate everything automatically, and every single thing becomes an holistic kind of experience. And that's what I basically teach my, my students, junior students, well as senior students, and it transforms them into appreciative manner instantaneously. They don't see a tree for a tree anymore. And that's the method of the Quran. It tells you, do you not see the tree? It gives you shade, it gives you fruit, it gives you wood, it gives you. So it actually encourages you to reflect. And that's basically what the artists do. They reflect. And it's the word of tafakkur. Tafakkur means to reflect. And there's a difference between reflection and uh, tafakkur and tadabur. Tadabur means you actually don't stand here and look at something. You actually get involved with it. So that's the basic way of how you basically get people to appreciate things more. You can appreciate the painting, but if you paint, it's much more exciting. So that's two different ways of dealing with something. And the main aspect of life is to appreciate. P appreciate the moment. Appreciate the ability to be able to paint. Appreciate the fact that you can see. And that's the way I basically teach my students. So it does immediate transformation. Thank you, Doc. I've got, if there aren't any questions from the on-site audience, I can read our questions from online, okay. if that's okay, unless there's questions in the audience. Okay, cool. Oh, here we go. <laughs> oh, it's a comment, okay, thank you. Let me just set it out there. Um, salam, uh, shukran for the talk. My name is Atia Khan, I'm a journalist, and I've been writing about arts and culture in Cape Town for some time. And last year I wrote a story about the history of Arabic calligraphy in the Cape because if we really look at it, we can trace um, graves in the Tanabaru Cemetery with Javi and Arabic calligraphy on these gravestones yeah. from like the 17th century, yeah. right? So this is kind of like a history of Cape Town and South Africa that's not really been looked at. It's been quite overlooked especially how this text, um, you know, even, even the first Afrikaans in South Africa was written in Arabic, in Madrasas, right? So I think um, the fact that this community and this, this art form has been marginalized in such a big way, that it, is, it ultimately ends up being within only Muslim communities, but it's actually been here as a way to teach the enslaved people who came from all different backgrounds, yes. you know? So I think it's very, very, very important in terms of filling in that gap of our history, um, in terms of bringing in the importance of Arabic calligraphy and oh well, Islamic art as well, um, especially from the historic point of slavery and how it moved through time. Um, I also wanted to say that I personally, since doing the story, started trying myself to learn uh, through an organization called um, Arabic Calligraphers South Africa, okay. um, AXA, who also exist within Cape Town. And I think there's a move to make the circle bigger and, in, and more inclusive in how do we make um, all of these people who are kind of interested, who've been learning, because it's really like a martial arts. Yes. You do it your whole life and you never 
really reach the peak. You know, there's yes. this master student thing. So there's so many people who are like part of this community, but they're like all underground and they never get shown in the mainstream when we talk about South African identity. So I, it's just, it's not a question, it's more of a comment to say that this work is so important. It must be more, uh, you know, visual. And the community needs to be brought in quite a bit. Thank and, you. The, and the writing about it as well. Thank you. Do you want to, to comment perhaps on that? No, no, I, I totally no. agree with it. You know, being marginalized for too long, it's the time that we expose what we are doing and show to the broader public. And Jane, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I think also um, we've we got to look at the value that it will add to our society. And that's the way to sell it. Um, so definitely I agree with you 100%. And maybe I can just comment for, for the people. Um, Arabic has got a, a, a quality that you can write any language in Arabic script because every particular letter has got vowel sounds that you can add on. So that's the way they taught the people about Islam who couldn't read Arab, who couldn't read Dutch or couldn't read the, 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 the Latin script. So they would actually write their language in Arabic script, and all the Muslims all over the world, they could translate, they could write the language of the people in Arabic script, because it can sound any particular language. And that's a fascinating uh, feature of Arabic. So you have the Timbuktu books, where those people's language is also written in Arabic script. So yes, um, I thank you for being taking that task and doing that kind of writing. Thank you very much. Yes, mine's also a comment. Hello, my name's Lisette. I'm also a calligrapher. I'm extremely interested in calligraphic line and um, passionate about Arabic calligraphy, although I don't practice it as an Arabic calligrapher. But in terms of the comment earlier about uh, introducing or broadening the uh, the community's understanding and appreciation of Arabic calligraphy as a part of Cape Town history and fabric. I think it's an extremely important conversation, but that needs to be had far more broadly than just the um, Muslim community, and that there's an opportunity with Arabic calligraphy to present... Um, Arabic art, um, Islamic art, the discussions such as you've had earlier, and um, to develop a broader appreciation of what Arabic calligraphy or Islamic art has meant through the centuries. And in that, there's a discussion around the unbroken tradition, the uh, tesip, what it brings, so Western calligraphy has had a broken tradition, whereas Arabic uh, or Islamic uh, calligraphy, and forgive me if I'm not using the correct term, presents a completely unbroken tradition and a, I think, incredible opportunity to unify people through the beauty of, of the art. Um, and you've talked very beautifully earlier about... Um, what, how people respond to, to the calligraphy and how they feel. And I feel that if we could go f further or broaden that deep appreciation and what is Kufic, uh, how were the styles brought about, what do they contribute, how incredible is the line and the tradition, that broadening it through the history within the Cape presents an opportunity to um, unify more than just a single part of our community. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, Thank you, Zed. Um, I'm just gonna, can I uh, perhaps uh, comment? On. One of the core features of Arabic script is it uses, it uses curvy linear style. You start from your right hand side, you curl and you go up and you come down. So that the style of the actual Arabic letters connects both half of the brain it connects the analytical side with the artistic side. And so when you start writing, it gives you a whole brain kind of feeling that allows you to transcend. And maybe the artist can actually take me further on that. 
No, there's nothing to add to it. <laughs> <laughs> it has that curvilinear style. And so as you start from the right to your left, it actually connects the two hemispheres because our education is left lobe centered. Mm -hmm. It's critical. Mm -hmm. It ignores the, the, the right lobe, which is the aesthetic side, the integrated, the holistic side. So the Arabic language actually brings those together. And if you recite it, if you recite it as well, it, it, it increases your vibration. And you can actually transcend and you can actually experience the time zone of the people that you're actually reciting. So it's like, really, it is a transformatory feature. It, it transcends you beyond your actual physical limitations. Yeah, there's just something also adding to that, Dr. Dr. Arnold. My dad has always told me, so my dad does a lot of uh, illumination or ornamentation, and that is repetitive tasks. Right, right. And it actually brings about a meditative state it of is. mind, which we, we call alpha state, you know, which is a yeah. thoughtful state. Yes. Which, so it does actually have that uh, spiritual aspect yeah, as well. The, the, the reason for that is because when you repeat something, you actually go into the wave of what the universe is all about. The wave actually, it moves at a particular state all at the same time. And when you get your body into that state, you can transcend and you can connect with the universe and it will supply you. So the interesting part of Arabic is, the word that means to orbit and the word that means to praise God is the same word. Everything in the heavens and the earth praises the creator. And when it praises, it orbits. And if you look at any particular religious person, when he starts remembering God, he starts doing that automatically. Whether they stand by the wailing wall, whether he's in church, whether he's sitting on a mat. The moment you start remembering creator and you start praising him, your body automatically goes into an an oscillation. Mm. So when you repeat, that actually you, you stimulate the, the molecules in your body to transcend and connect with the spirit, and then you transcend. Mm. Mm. I can explain it well. I, I, I don't do it much. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not at that level yet, but, but I, I know that it does happen. And each one of us have got that something experience about it. That when your, your feeling is sincere, you transcend. And one of our particular experiences is what they call deja vu. You come to a place and you say, but I've been here. But you haven't been here. But your intention was so pure that you transcended your space and time and your soul arrived and then your body only comes. Wow. <laughs> wow, <Doug. laughs> That's a good way of looking at it. It's actually very interesting. Thank you. Wow, Doug, wonderful. Wow, that was incredible. We have another question here at the back. Hi. I'm here because I saw your wonderful um, mural in Salt River. Okay, and thank it you. actually moved me really very much. I'm not, I'm not, I don't know um, art in Islam, but that, I think, oh, street yeah. art is your canvas to bring in what people were talking about, the history, um, to, to bring the inclusiveness of Islam in Cape Town, I think that's your canvas. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Is, it's, is it's the walls of the town, yeah. where, they, where um, you will actually prompt um, dialogue and conversation about it, as I think your work in Salt River does. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, can I just say about the actual artist, um, um, what the artists do, the, uh, the arts in Islam, is they, if they see a blank wall or any particular or a spoon or something, they will then put calligraphy on that, which is like a Quranic ayah, etc., to make that piece not dead anymore. It becomes a timeless piece now. It's a timeless wall. If you look at the Jerusalem now at the moment, as much as they want to bomb, they will never bomb the Masjid al-Aqsa itself because the beauty of it alone is a message. And if you look at Alhambra in Spain, many people have become Muslim by just looking at the actual architecture. They just, it just makes them transcend. And they don't know Arabic whatsoever, but just the beauty of it and the intention of the artist. The intention of the artist is to remind you of God. It's not about me, the artist, I sign my name. It's about I want to present beauty from myself to remind you of the creator who comes past it. And that's why it's his intention that's speaking to you. And then you just feel it. You know, so I hope I, I've made add to that. Yes, thank you, Doug. 
Thank you. Okay, we have another question from from you, but yeah, I mean, yeah, if you will, yeah. let me just. I can hold the microphone for you. You don't have to. I just want to say that um, I have a deep sense that calligraphy is experiencing a tremendous global revival. Absolutely. And now, especially during the lockdown uh, in, in the West, uh, so many thousands and thousands of young people have begun taking up calligraphy. I've been to the Sharjah Calligraphy Biennial twice. It's the world's biggest calligraphy event. It's extremely popular. Um, there, there are major calligraphy events happening in Russia, and, uh, annual uh, symposiums, which are tended, attended by thousands of people. There are numerous annual events happening in the United States. Um, symposiums, uh, people are, uh, are teaching online. Uh, the, the whole graffiti art world is feeding into a youthful enthusiasm for, for calligraphy, uh, some of it very amateurish, a lot of it really an interesting cutting-edge art which breaks all the rules and is starting to establish some of its own. Um, Arabic calligraphers like El Cid, I'm sure that's a name that uh, many of you have heard, um, I met him in, in, in Sharjah as well, is doing um, work that is iconic, it's setting a precedent, and it's huge, um, not just from a popularity point of view, but from a size point of view as well. And I just want to finish off uh, that whole little ramble by saying, uh, and to have the Zeitz Mocker feature um, uh, the, the, your guys' work um, and to hold this talk, I think it's just yet another sign in my mind of uh, how that calligraphy is beginning to achieve a, um, a renewed appreciation and enthusiasm on a, on a global scale. Uh, thanks to the Zeitz. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Andre. I have a question from online, directly to Mr. Ahmad and Dr. Arnold. How would, you how would you describe the link between Islamic art and the progress of South African society? Pretty broad, but like, yeah, a lot to work with. Well, it, as, as you know, this is one of the first kind of exposures of the art in Islam in the broader uh, South Africa. So it, it's only starting now. And I'm, 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 as I say, we're grateful to Zeist to actually open up, and I hope it will. And it, it will transform lots of the thinking and the compartmentalization of things. So yes, it's only starting. It's not something that, that, that has really made an impact yet. But as you say, it is starting. There is a waqt for everything. There's a time for everything. And one of the things that COVID has done is to, to self-reflection. We've been cut off from every particular thing that we're dependent on. And we are bringing back to depend on the creator alone. And this has been the kind of a thing that has called us to our own creativity and to bring forward our community. Now we actually love each other more because we've been separated. And so... Hopefully, we'll take the art world as well with it because the artist basically, according to Carl Jung, Carl Jung said that the artist is the first level of the connection of the unseen world through the artist into the world. If you look at Carl, work, Carl Jung's work, he will say an artist does not create. He allows himself to be there for the archetypes to come through him and to present, which is like beautiful. It's a, so, yeah, we, we, we're only starting now. Okay. Yeah, I agree, but I have a vision, you know, that Islamic art must not only be amongst the elite. Islamic art must go to the poorer communities. I believe that Islamic art is supposed to be in the townships, in the rural areas. That is where Islamic art will develop. We, as South Africans, must develop a South African Islamic art. We must stop not copying other people, but we must create our own style. Our calligraphy must change not to follow the Arabs or the Indians or the Iranians. We must create our own South African style of writing. We must create our own South African style of decorating our work. That is when Islamic art will flourish. At the moment, it will not go anywhere. If I go internationally and I exhibit my work, they confuse me to being an Arab or Indian, but not South African, because my work doesn't reflect South Africa. And we've got to change our mindset 
and take Islamic art to the dancers and educate the people and take what they got and incorporate it into our art. Change the Islamic art the way we look at it and become, come up with a new style, totally new style. God don't punish us for doing that. It will be the same message, but only in a different form and a different style. That's all. Thank you. Thank you so much. I have an, another question from online. How open are the Sony men to trying out the Islamic calligraphy taught by traditional masters? Can you, can you say it again? How open are the Sony men, like so yourself and Shaheen, to trying out the Islamic calligraphic art taught by traditional masters? So like, yeah, I guess how, yeah. how much do you reference the traditional masters, I imagine? Shaheen? Um, you're talking about the uh, masters as in master in calligraphy or ornamentation? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so just repeat the question, sorry, I didn't follow properly. How open are you to trying out the Islamic calligraphy taught by traditional masters. Oh, no, no, definitely. Um, I, I'll be open to do it, but at the same time, I do realize what the task entails. You know, you can't just sit down for a couple of weeks and, and, and become a calligrapher. Um, it, it takes dedication. It takes years of practice to actually perfect the skill. In fact, um, I, I know a friend of mine, Nazmi Jones, he, he received his ijazat, which is the permission to teach, and that took him four years studying in Egypt. And normally, because of the master-student relationship, you need a master to be able to teach as well. Um, I don't know if we have many masters here in South Africa. Um, uh, but uh, I would be open to learn, but I, I'm not completely... My, my, my goal is not to become a calligrapher. My goal is to create art that inspires people. That is my goal. Thank you. Another question says... Which calligraphers do you take inspiration from? So uh, we know that your direct source of inspiration is God mm -hmm. and, okay, and so the spiritual, but are there any individuals that you take inspiration from? So, so my world of calligraphy basically comes from my dad. So the calligraphy that I have seen most in my life has been my dad's style of calligraphy. Mm -hmm. And the way he writes it, like I told you, he, he often sketches the calligraphy, which is very different to writing calligraphy. And I'm able, because I work with it every day, I see his work every day, I'm able to recognize the unique uh, forms of his particular way of writing. So, in fact, when I do my uh, digital design, when it comes to uh, canvas work, and even with my uh, 3D laser cutting work, I use my father's calligraphy. So I use it, I take his calligraphy and I use it, I personalize that artwork. Right. Thank you, Shane. Mr. Ahmad, any individuals you take inspiration from? Um, no, not actually, you know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm a man of very little words, you know. I, I, I already speak, so, so don't ask me these questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a practical guy, you know. Give me a brush and I'll paint. Mm. But don't ask me to speak. Mm, 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 mm. Can I can I Dog comment? Uh, can I comment? Uh, there is there is this kind of uh, traditional kind of um, way we have been taught to follow another person, and then to follow another person. What 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 we do do not realize is that if you learn from a person, you will only have eighty percent of what you've learned in terms of quality. And if you teach somebody else, you'll have 70%. So by the time it gets down to the 10th person, you've lost most of the style. But if you look at creativity, that is a divine quality. And if we start looking at traditionalism, we can break ourselves in becoming submissive to certain no independent thinking. It becomes dependent thinking. And that's, I think, what uh, Sonys are saying. Let's be creative. There are basic principles of Islam that you cannot break. Those must stay in place. Mm. But in terms of style, let the creativity flow and let it come out because even yourself are going to be astounded by what comes out of your own creativity because that is in the hands of the creator. But we have this kind of, I call it a bureaucratic approach, <laughs> you know, I say, that the one in charge does X. At the end of the day, you get, I mean, I, was, I experienced it when I taught 
when I taught calligraphy because there's so many different styles. Some doctor came to me and said to me, what right do you have to teach calligraphy? You did not learn by somebody. <laughs> and that is the killer. And I think that is where our artists are coming from. Let it flow. Yeah. And I think that is what we need to know, that each particular person will come out with his own feature, mm -hmm. which will turn the tables and in many ways makes differences. Can I add something to that that he said now? You know, I was once told also by a, a calligrapher that my calligraphy mustn't be in any other color but black. <laughs> he writes in black. So I can't paint any calligraphy in red or blue or any other color. That is the way they think. So we've got to change this way of thinking that calligraphy is not really, you know, something that, that, is, that is got to be done according to a strict rule. Calligraphy can be changed as well. It's not... As an, as an, it mustn't conform to any set rule made by another person. It can change. But I think what is the, the proof of it is there are 15 different styles that have come about from different countries and different tribes. That tells you already that creativity and to allow creativity with the basics still is the most important thing for, a, for any society to grow. And I think that, that I, I'm not saying we mustn't respect people that are masters. No, we can learn from them. But people must not bully one another mm -hmm. to stay at one spot and just do it their way. Uh, that's not, uh, that is not art. That is not creativity. I think also, uh, just speaking about that, like that, that tradition, if you look at the master-student tradition, uh, that, is, that, that has been coming for many, many years. And yes, yes. I personally respect that, that way of doing things. Uh, it's just that I do things differently, it's more yes. in an you know, artistic environment, but I do respect their rules. I, I respect everything that they stand for yeah. because you know, that, that, that is for them, that I, is valid for them. I think one of the Islamic guidelines is the last khutbah of Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu in Arafah. He says, those who are present, please take the message to those who are absent. And maybe those who get it later will have a better understanding than you who are present. And that tells you that learning exposes itself how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants as the generations go by. So yes, there is also a hadith that says one generation will be worse than the next generation, and the, the new generation will be worse than the previous one. Well, let's strike the balance and respect the old, respect the people mm -hmm. of tradition, and also respect the creative person. Mm -hmm. And nobody must stop anyone else because that is the killing of a society. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you so much. If there aren't any questions from the audience, I'm going to have to abuse my hosting powers and call this meeting to an end. Want one more? Okay. We'll put, squeeze in one more. Okay. I wanted to ask a question, also make a comment um, of something that I observed when I moved to Cape Town. Um, I found that there, there tended to be within the art industry a reservation when it came to uh, exhibiting arts from uh, the Muslim communities. And I always wondered why this was. And I wanted to touch on just something that sometimes is a bit of an elephant in the room. And of course, there are issues around Islam as a whole that sometimes people do feel apprehensive approaching. Uh, sometimes there's a, le a level of um, misunderstanding or fear. What I would like to understand is, do you feel, uh, and I think the question goes to both uh, Uncle Ahmed and uh, Dr. Fadu is, and, and Shaheen as well, that do you feel that non-religious audiences and the fact that the art world can be quite secular, how would you envis envision um, being able to bring, you know, like we have this audience today, how would you like to have a dialogue with the wider art community in terms of for young Muslim creatives to be able to be themselves, to be able to explore their creativity and still be Muslim? Good question. Ahmed? I, I think the... the I, I think the, the, the principles, when, when, when the principles are set, in other words, I give an example, my daughter's of from learning from me in terms of the arts in Islam is that don't try to present the human being as is. 
And if you study the arts in Islam, you'll find that they do not present a human being or an animal as is. They will actually do a flat two-dimensional with no shadowing. Because by, by putting in shadows and being three-dimensional, they will be going against the grain of, the, of Islam. So they do it more cartoon-like. And they deliberately uh, make it, uh, in actual fact, it doesn't have the same uh, dimensions. It will make the head bigger or the feet smaller or something. So they will distort the figure on purpose. They will also put in mistakes in the artwork to make the human aspect visible because they say only the creator is perfect. So they've applied certain principles in the art world which does not try to imitate the creator because they say if you try to imitate the creator, you are insulting because the human being that is painted cannot speak and neither can it talk and think. So don't try to imitate the creator. So they've symbolized everything. So when you teach people the actual symbolism and the meaning of the symbolism, whether they be Muslim or non-Muslim, the symbolism itself allows them to transcend and keep within the framework of divine requirements because all people believe in a God inside of you. And they know what is right and wrong. All you need to show them is how do you do it effectively. So my work basically was to, to take the art in Islam and simplify it for children and using just a black pen or a normal kind of crayon. And that became an international thing that I was then asked to do the consulting and the writing for the International Islamic University in Malaysia because it was the first time that they saw that such a highfalutin art form was simplified for children. And that's where you actually encourage people. And I've had students of all walks of life that would do my courses at the Franks of Art Center. And they would be like jewelers, calligraphers, artists, builders, and they would take the idea and, and imp impose it onto their own skill. And they were not even Muslim, some of them. But just the idea of this, this balance and this, this, this kind of reflection, etc., that they apply. So it's, it's, it's about teaching them the principles and then allowing them, as, as Buddha Ahmed says, to be able to do it with simple things like wire or a plaque pin or a piece of stick and not expect them to do gold plating. You know, it's like out of our, out of our reach. Just simplify it and teach them the basic principles and it will go anyway, inshallah. Thank you for the very good question and the very great answer. I'm going to have to bring this discussion to an end, guys. Thank it's you. been very wonderful. My soul is fed. I don't feel hungry anymore. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Thank you for coming out. I'd like to thank Belinda and Tiffany for the work in the, on the tech. Danny also on the video. And to our panelists, thank you so very much. And good evening to you all. Thank you. Thank you very much.